After Hamas's murderous invasion on October 7, Israel has been at war. But since that war began, even as people acknowledge that Israel has a right to defend itself, there has been a question about the deaths of civilians in war, casualties. And that's a philosophic question. We wanted to tackle that today. Welcome to New Idea Live. I'm Ilan Jerno, joined today by Onkar Gatte. Onkar, I, I want to just dive into this topic because I think it's it's a difficult issue for people to think about for a number of reasons, partly because it's there's timeless issues here about how do you conduct any kind of conflict? What's the right way to think about the moral issues? And in this particular con context, it's a, it's a highly controversial issue. There are a lot of pitiful images and, and really emotional uh, uh, photographs we're seeing. And, and so I think, I think there's, there's just a, a high intensity to this conflict. So when we think about this question about how what, what should happen to uh, how to think about the casualties in a conflict like this, where do you start with this as a philosopher? I start with thinking about the nature of war and to not sanitize, whitewash, sugarcoat what war is. War is brutal. And I think it, it's really important to hold that in mind. That, And from a, the perspective of a free country or a free nation, you should never want to go to war. That doesn't mean you won't sometimes have to, but it is, it, it's literally, a life and death issue and we can have in if you leave aside or if you think of america pre 9 11 there was a this kind of perspective that well war happens in other places in the globe but it doesn't really involve us unless we want to get involved in something part of what was shocking about 9 11 was there were attacks on our own soil and there was a perspective of like that can't happen to us um, when there's bombings and so on. It's our Marines in the Middle East or something like that. Uh, and you kind of living in that environment, you can think of war in a way that is completely inappropriate. And, and one of the ways I think about it is like our experience with it is we play video games where it's Call of Duty or things like that or war or you see war on movies and there's a way in which one it can glamorize and sanitize it. And what it really is, it's, I think of it, it's the breakdown of civilization. It's the breakdown of civilized interaction. You no longer try to trade with someone else and someone in a foreign land or go your own way and say, no, like we don't have any interest in common. You go do your thing. We're going to do our thing. It, it's now you're killing each other. And in war, it's, kill or be killed. That's what it means that it's a life and death issue. So j just in any war, it's, it is, the, I think one should think of it as we didn't want to get into this war. Unfortunately, we're now involved in it. What do we do? But it's, it's a grim and it's, I think, necessarily a traumatic situation that like, do you, do you want to kill people? Um, and my view is like even enemy. No, I would. I want the enemy just to be left to its own devices. I don't want to enter into armed conflict with people. You have to do it if it's necessary, but you would do everything to avoid it. And this was Ayn Rand's perspective, I think, that America should arm itself to the hilt such that nobody would dare attack us and that we would respond and we would respond with overwhelming might when we are attacked so that in the future people would think twice and three times before attacking us. So because you don't want to enter into war. And I mean, it results even if you win, it's death, it's significant injury and it's real trauma um, to your own soldiers. I mean, like the phenomenon of PTSD is a real phenomenon. And it haunt, can haunt people for the rest of their lives that they were had to engage in this kind of activity. And in that context, if you really take seriously what war is, I think it's the obligation of a free nation that when it's attacked, 
It fights to win. And win means win. It means victory. It means ending the threat of the enemy or posed by the enemy, which means ending the enemy with as little cost, and especially that's in terms of the death of your own soldiers with the, and civilians, so your own citizens. The death toll has to be as low as possible. You use every resource you have. And if you're, the, if you're a much stronger power than who's attacked you, you still use every resource you have to end the enemy. Um, and that's the, uh, the, the way look, that's the overall context in which you have to think about this issue. And if you have some kind of um, um, kind of fantasy about what war is, and that it and think it's not it, either it's not brutal or it doesn't have to be brutal, I think you are just fooling yourself. Well, let me bring this to the context of the situation in the Middle East and Israel and Hamas. One of the things we've heard a lot of people, including President Biden, say is it's imperative to, for Israel in particular, to distinguish between aggressors on the one hand and innocent civilians on the other, and to minimize and to, to minimize the harm done to civilians. With what you've just said, then it it doesn't seem like that's compatible with what it means to win at, at minimum uh, cost to your own side and as quickly as possible, because it seems like what you might need to do is use overwhelming force. How do you think about this issue of trying to distinguish between, and, and are those even the categories? Uh, civilians, innocent civilians, aggressors, what are the different parties that one can think about? Yeah, I think of it is you can think of it in terms of the leadership of the aggressor you're fighting. And in the case of Israel, that Hamas, essentially is a government it's a it's a gang but it's a gang that seized power in gaza that, and and it was in effect a kind of a not a protracted but a civil war after they won the majority of seats in an election of pushed out its political rival but what that really means pushed out another gang and seized control and in that sense it 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 is, and I think it views itself as we're the governing power. It's a tyrannical dictatorial power, as in many places in the Middle East, but it is the power. So what when that Israel's at war, it's at war with an enemy nation, in effect. Even if it doesn't have all the contours of a nation, that in effect is what it is at, at fighting. And to to win means to put, bring an end to this regime as a military and political force, I think. And that means um, putting an end to its military political leadership in the same way. So again, here, so part of what it would mean to really be thinking about this issue and thinking about war, civilians, innocence in war, you have to think about other wars. So what did we do in regard to Germany or Japan in World War II? What, did, what is it that we had to bring an end to? We had to bring an end to Germany's military and political leadership of bring an end to the, the power of the army to keep fighting and of the, of the political leadership to be ordering everybody in the country to continue the fight against the, the allied forces and the same in Japan. So I think of that as that's the primary target. That's what you're trying to accomplish. That's when, when you're thinking about victory, it's that's what you've brought an end to. But to accomplish that will often mean civilian casualties. And there's you, that's just inescapable. And it can't be a de de deterrent to self-defense. So Hamas, let's say, and as we've seen in past rounds of fighting, positions its rocket launchers in the kindergartens or in on the grounds of a hospital, it positions its munitions in a, in a school. And the what, what I'm hearing from you is that the fact that it is doing that is using its population as a, hostages or shields or both, that should not be a reason not to target those sites because those sites are in effect the means by which this 
opposing quasi government or quasi regime is fighting you and you need to destroy them so that that even if many civilians are killed in the process they are their deaths are the the responsibility of Hamas as the ruling authority in that area which has initiated the the aggression yeah i mean so the part of the context that is really important is they're the aggressor and they've been the aggressor since their inception their charter document is we exist to wipe israel off the map and israel it, there's no parallel in regard to israel israel does not exist to get rid of hamas or muslims or muslims from the holy land so that's not why it's there so there's one aggressor in this conflict and it's hamas and all those who are animated by the cause of wiping israel off the map and in that context that part of their strategy and i mean as you know and you've written about this it's deliberate strategy on hamas's part and and they're not um, unique in this regard to use um their dictators so to use their subjects as human shields with the hope that either israel will think well we don't want to kill these people so maybe we shouldn't bomb and so maybe we can't bring an end to hamas to the in, a, in the sense of its military and political leadership and might or that israel might do it but the world opinion will be will descend upon israel how dare you do this and we're going to stop supporting you if you continue to do this so that international pressure will be brought on them that no you can't actually engage in what your self defense requires so it's a strategy that is um trying to to basically use a concern for morality in this case i think a mistaken um concern but either on the part of the israelis themselves or the wider international community to basically say how dare you do this and that will enable hamas to continue to exist and to continue to plot against israel with the goal of with their ultimate goal of wiping israel off the map so let's un unpack some of these ideas because I, I i'm sure people listening will have will be thinking about either views they hold or things they've heard as counterpoints so one is how can you equate everyone who is living in gaza with hamas how can you think of them all as equally culpable equally responsible so let, let's talk about civilians versus innocents and what does it mean to be innocent in a conflict like this particularly with the gaza context in, uh, as we see it yeah i think one thing that is very important to distinguish is there's two senses of responsibility here that one can easily blend or blur and it's important to separate them even though in reality they can go together but they're separable intellectually and they need to be separated which is is a civilian um causally responsible or partly responsible for the continuing ability of the aggressor nation to be fighting you and is it are those civilians morally responsible for the the place that they're in and, and you can even think of it as as the the fact that they are causally responsible for helping the fight continue against you and sometimes it will be both and precisely because like so the people who voted for hitler and helped bring the nazis into power they're both morally responsible for the fact that now the nazis have political power and they're causally responsible for it, for bringing them into power but also they're part of the german citizenry that is now being um marshaled to build a whole war machine that we saw in world war ii and that's a causal responsibility and even the people who voted against hitler but now are working at companies and so on that are building munitions supplies for the army the food supply lines and so on 
they're all part of the war machine. And even if they've been, uh, if it's like forced labor and there was forced labor in Nazi Germany or in Soviet Russia, it's still the fact is they're part of what's causally responsible for making the enemy able to keep fighting. And if you're going to bring the enemy's ability and will to fight to an end, and if you're going to do it swiftly and as, at little cost to your own soldiers, and I think that's the moral responsibility of the government of any free nation. The government is an agent of its citizens. It's not a policeman of the world. It's not an agent of every citizen. It's an agent of its citizens. And particularly when it sends its soldiers to war, it's their agent, their representative, you, the government has to be doing everything to minimize the death of its own soldiers in the fight. And if that means crippling the supply lines of the enemy forces, of, of crippling their food supplies such that you're starving them. Um, and, and it's part of what happened, uh, say, with the Nazis fighting Russia. And part of it is, is it, even if it wasn't deliberately targeted when winter came and so on, their supply lines are... Uh, was a huge issue. They're freezing to death and so on. And that made it harder for the Nazis to fight. And so even deliberately targeting civilian civilians and civilian infrastructure in war, I think is legitimate when there's when it's part of the whole fight against bringing an end militarily and politically to this regime that is attacking you, you, the, uh, free, the government of a free nation has to do it if it really is, yes, I mean, if the military is telling them, yes, like if we did this, if we bombed factories in Germany or Japan, that will make it much harder for their soldiers to keep killing our soldiers. It's the, the government's responsibility to say, yeah, that then has to be part of our strategy. It has to be part of our means for achieving victory. Yeah, let me put a a counterpoint here and tell me how we can unpack this. So to so take someone who's living in Gaza, who either wasn't alive at the time Hamas came, was voted into power or took power by force, and now is an adult, so around 18, I guess, and that person is, is opposed to Hamas, they would rather have a better government, a freer government. They can't get out of Gaza is very restricted, and they if they fight Hamas, they, they will get retribution. Um, so how do you think of that person if they are in, caught up in a, in, a, in a retaliatory strike by Israel? What is the, how, how do you think about the, the culpability for that person's death, for example? Yes, so there is for sure such a thing as innocent people in enemy territory. The most obvious is young kids who are just too young even to have any kind of viewpoints um, and to, to kind of legitimately have picked a side. They don't vote in these people into power. And so, on. so they're obviously innocent. And there are people at, at, at an adult level who are active opponents of these regime, active opponents of Hamas. I've read about some, I'm sure you've read in the last couple of weeks about some of these people and who rightly view Hamas as the uh, the first and in, in a certain sense, the um, primary victim, not in the sense their goal is to um, wipe Israel off the face of the map. So in that sense, what animates them, that's what animates them. But to seize power, the first thing they have to do is um, tyrannize and lord over the people in Gaza. So the first victims in that sense are the people in Gaza who are being oppressed by Hamas. And there, people should be opposed to that. And there are people in Gaza who are opposed to that. And if they're actively opposed, that says something good about them. To be truly innocent, I think it has to be you're opposing them for the right reasons. That is what you want is a better freedom respecting government. It's not, well, I'm on the side of the PLO or of the more secular dictators, not this religious dictatorship. That's what I don't want. And if you if and 
there's been many examples of that in history. One of the most prominent and obvious ones is the Nazis and communists fought each other. I mean, they fought each other, Russia versus Nazi Germany, but they fought internally in Germany. And it's just one group wanting to be dictator and wanting to kill the other people. And it's just the, so the mere fact that you oppose the Nazis doesn't make you innocent. If what your goal was, well, I want a communist dictatorship, not a Nazi dictatorship. But if you're actually opposed to them for the right reasons and in support of a free or semi-free form of government, if such would arise and there would be candidates and so on, yes, you're on the side of, of the good. And it would be, I mean, pointless, but worse than pointless for a free country like Israel to target those people. Um, so, and in, indeed, if, if they're able to work with some of these people in the attempt to bring an end to Hamas, just as we worked in Afghanistan, for instance, with people who opposed the Taliban. And if these people were, yeah, well, we're, what we're hoping with is we get some kind of free or semi-free government that replaces these people. Those are, they're active resistors. They're a positive, you should want to work with them. Um, but having said all that, that the fact that there's active resistors in enemy territory also cannot jeopardize your military objectives and military strategy. That if, for instance, you have to bomb and you know in the bombing, some of these people will likely be caught in the bombing, that can't stop you. You might, if you're able to give them warning to say, you know, we're going to be bombing here, you might want to get out. Yeah, do all that because they are allies. But it, they can't jeopardize the overall strategy. And, it, and I think a useful element or a useful example here to think about is, so the Nazis took over France. There was active French resistance to this. And the Allied forces rightly viewed them like they're part of our allies. We want to work with them if we can help them sabotage train lines and supply lines of the Nazis. Yeah, that's all a good thing. We should do that. We should view them as allies. But we will also have to bomb and invade France. And if some of these people are caught in that, um, it's tragic. We're not trying to do that. We're not targeting them. But we also can't say, oh, well, we can't go into France because some of these active resistors might be killed in it. And, and what do we do? So all that does is empowers the Nazis. Um, and that's like that's true in any war that it's part of what it means to say that war is brutal. Um, and yet it's even that good people are going to die. Soldiers are on your side, allies in enemy territory and so on. But the, the moral responsibility again for all of the deaths lie with the aggressor. If we're talking about an aggressor attacking a free or semi-free nation, it's responsible for starting the war and it's responsible for all the destruction that ensues. If we're talking about a free or semi-free nation fighting in legitimate self-defense. So what would you say to the, the, so let's just go back to the question of children because that one is there, no one can expect a child to, to be engaged in politics, to have a responsibility. That's not what we, how we think of children. They're, they're not yet at that level and you're, from what I'm hearing is one has to think of them as similar to the active resistor who has either no position or a positive position. And it, it is a tragic outcome, but it's not something, there's no advantage in going after children militarily necessarily, and you wouldn't want to do that, but that might be a consequence. Yeah. I, I mean, I think of an active resistor as they're a positive force. They're on your side or potentially on your side, a child, it's certainly not morally responsible and it's not even causally but like both aspects of responsibility when we're talking about a young child they're not working in a factory and so on but when they that starts to happen and if you know say about nazi germany it was first they're taking 18 year olds and then well we're we need more people and we're losing so we need 16 year olds and then 14 year olds and so on. it there comes a time even for a child that these kinds of regimes, they're using them to feed the war machine. 
And in that kind of situation, again, and it's not pleasant to have to do this, but it's again, like if you have to bomb factories that are supplying weapons to the front lines of what you're fighting and what they've, they've um, conscripted in effect, it's like a draft, um, that they 12 year olds into these factories. Um, yeah, the 12, they might not even know what's going on. They might not even fully know what they're doing in the fact, like what the factory's producing and so on. And in that sense, they're certainly not morally responsible, but then they become causally responsible for the continued ability of the Nazis to be killing your soldiers. And that requires one to think, okay, like militarily, can we bring this to a stop? And it's, and it, so you can, and I mean, there was a lot of firebombing of cities in Nazi Germany. And that was, you know, you're killing kids when you do that. Um, and yet that's what victory actually required. And if you don't do it, all it means is more death of your own soldiers. And it, a, a government, it, it's illegitimate for a government to do that. It's the representative of its citizens. It can't bargain them away in any kind of bargain, including a supposedly um, moral, that morality requires this. So your point about the way the Nazis were feeding young people into their war machine is the, the Hitler Youth, of course, was sort of an ideological indoctrination process. And one of the things that is often dropped out of the picture when people think about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is that definitely we know this about Hamas. We know this about some of the PLO factions, the more quasi-secular uh, elements of the Palestinian movement. It is a known goal that they indoctrinate their children from as young as possible into their beliefs and in the glorification of murder. So when you hear of the atrocities that Hamas committed on October 7th and, and for decades before that, it shouldn't, part of it should not be surprising because if you have television programs for children telling them that glory is to be found in slaughtering the Jews and wiping them off the map, then when they reach the age when they're put a, a knife is put in their hand or a machine gun is put in their hand and they're set off across the border to inflict harm, it, it's not a surprise because they have been encouraged in that view and indoctrinated in that view. And that is a big part of what the Palestinian cause has been doing. It is, it's an, they have deliberately tried to generate more and more people within their community to fight for the cause. And that requires years of cultivation. I don't, I don't think you can quickly turn a child into a murderer, but it takes time and it's, some, it's a concerted goal. So I think in that sense, it, this is not a claim about the culpability of children in Gaza right now, but it's a, it's a point about the responsibility of Hamas and of the other Palestinian factions in gener generating continuous flow of people who are committed to their view of how to wipe Israel off the map and, and committed to the pro willing to commit these sorts of atrocities. So, and I think there's, there's a real, that should be part of how people think about Hamas. It can't just be, oh, they took power and they're, they're, they're in a community of people who would rather not have them. Neither of those is the decisive factor. They took power because they were very popular and they were, even before they were, in power through those legitimate means that the Western powers endorsed, they were cultivating people for a whole society, not just individual people through summer camps, through schools, through textbooks, through television and radio programming. So there's that hothouse environment ideologically is crucial for thinking about what the Palestinian society looks like. And, and to turn that point around, to the extent you find people who are actively resisting Hamas and the other Palestinian factions for the, for the right reasons, as you point out, that kind of person is not just innocent, they're heroic. I mean, it, it takes a lot to, be, to choose to, to reject the ideas that you're marinating in and that you're pushed, uh, pushed on you from as young an age as possible. So I, I think those are important considerations for people to think about. So 
and this is especially true because one of the facts that comes up often is that the population of Gaza is, I think, 50% are under 18, something like that. So out of the 2.1 million people or so, many of them are young, many of them are not adults yet. The thing to know is that they're fed a certain kind of ideological vision of what society looks like and what a good person is and what heroism is and what is where does glory lie. Uh, th there's another point I wanted to raise here, which is, I've seen this a lot from people commenting on the issue. So one way in which this is put is, Okay, so what if let's let's posit that every majority of Palestinians did vote for Hamas? Should we be punishing them for their choice? So this is sort of the 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 idea that well it was a democratic vote and how could you be opposed to that? Yes, I don't think of war as punishment, and I think it's important that it not be thought like that. Putting it in terms of punishment is putting it in, in a kind of legal ter terminology of that what a legal system does is, well, it punishes criminals. We're not dealing with individual criminals here. And part of the whole mistake in terms of the conceptualization and so strategy in the Middle East, I think both on the part of Israel and America, certainly America after 9-11, sorry, before 9-11, and there was some attempt to reverse it after 9-11, but it was so bad, and we can talk about various ways and why it was so bad, that, so prior to 9-11, when there were attacks, and there were many, many attacks on U.S. interests, including attacks on the World Trade Center. Um, so in New York, there was a bombing. It was always treated as it's like you have a criminal and we need to find the criminal and bring it. And it was where we have to bring him to trial and have a whole trial. And so that's treating it like you're dealing with um, uh, someone uh, like an O.J. Simpson who's committed murder. And yes, you have to have a trial. And it and it, so it's, it's a citizen of the country. Here you're dealing with enemy forces and. Everybody in the U.S. kind of government intelligence knows that these people are being financed, funded, trained, armed by nation states with it, Iran at the helm. Um, and this is true of Hamas and Hezbollah. So they can't be viewed as just like you've got an individual criminal. And then in that kind of context, it would be like, really, you're punishing the criminal's family for something this individual did. And yeah, there is no collective punishment like that. It would be completely illegitimate for a government to do that. When you're in war, it's not an issue you want to punish the other side. The issue is you want victory. You're bringing the other side's existence to an end. You're ending the Nazi regime. You're ending the Japanese military and basically the whole Japanese government. You're bringing it to an end. It will no longer exist. And part of what the U.S. did in Japan afterwards is it occupied it for a while and it built up. No, you're going to have a different government and, it, you're, it, and it's going to be demilitarized and you're not going to have this power anymore. That, that, that's not a, it's not we punished them. It's we brought this regime to an end and ensured that nothing like it's going to arise in the next five years or 10 years. And again, that's not punishment or dropping the, the atomic bombs on Japan. It wasn't to punish them. It was to achieve victory, to bring the hostilities and the power of an aggressor to the end, uh, to an end. And that's how it has to be thought about. It's not, you're not um, bombing civilian infrastructure to punish. You're doing it so that the power of the aggressor comes to an end, that they're defeated, and hopefully that they surrender. But if they don't surrender, then you have to kill the whole um, of the uh, leadership and the apparatus such that the attacks and aggression against you comes to an end. So it's very different than the issue of you're trying to find and, and punish. What you're trying to do is bring the enemy's power to an end. 
before we went live, we were talking about this, and one of the points that came out in that conversation, I, I think it's worth bringing in here, which is this is a, one of the criticisms I would make of Israel's policy in the past, which is it has treated or it, it its response to Palestinian aggression has been to, in effect, behave as if it's punishment, as opposed to this is an enemy force. It's trying to destroy us. We need to end this enemy force. It's a, it's a long drawn out war. And it's so it's a shift between this is actually a war, even if it's dragging on across decades. It's a shift from what that reality is to, well, it's a it's a punishment. It's a uh, we're, we're maintaining stability and it's treating it much more like a criminal matter where they send out three, they shot 3,000 rockets at Israel. Okay, let's flatten some buildings and show them that they can't get away with it. And then they come back a year or two later with tunnels and, and more rockets and so on. So to me, that's, that is a, uh, a pattern in Israeli policy that I think is, is in, in, in important ways, reinforces and kind of encourages more attacks. Yeah, and it encourages as well that it's, look, you're punishing people who didn't even do this. And so, but if it were in the context, no, we're not punishing you. What we're trying to do is bring an end to Hamas. Um, it would have been very different and it would have been thought about and should have been thought, at least should have been thought about, very different about, yeah, there's civilian casualties, civilian infrastructure being destroyed. And part of the tragedy is, and this is true kind of throughout the Middle East, if this were done right away, it would be relatively easy to have to do. So if when the moment Hamas is exerting power, making its intentions and goals clear, and then starting to carry those through in action, starting to attack Israelis or starting to, to gain control of uh, Gaza, if it was then that it was, oh, no, we're going to end this regime, it would have been, relatively speaking, easy compared to what it is now that it's so entrenched. Yeah, it has a whole system of tunnels. I mean, they, this, I watched some of the reports. They describe it almost like it's an underground city. Um, and and they're much more heavily armed. And now, I mean, what at least what Israel says, and I hope they actually try to carry this through in action, is that we're going to bring Hamas to an end. It's not we're going to punish them and hope that they'll have learned their lesson. No, there, and that part of the, why that's futile is, there, as we've talked about, the goal is the destruction of Israel. There's no lesson they can learn. All they'll learn is, okay, maybe this tactic didn't work um, in trying to achieve this goal, so we're going to try something else. But until um, the, that goal disappears, and in this case, I think that means that the leadership has to be destroyed. They're not going to reform. It's not... Um, if you have a, uh, uh, if they lose in a military battle, they might think, yeah, maybe we should drop our goal of destroying Israel. And this is in part because it's a religious motivation that it they have to be destroyed. And unless Israel's willing to do that, yeah, it will be, oh yeah, okay, we exerted some punishment for what you did. We hope you don't do it again. And it might for five years, nothing might happen. Just as as um, sort of that that's the hope. But I think it's just, it's uh, to hope in vain. And I want to say just one other thing about Hamas, that the, I think one of the most important things to hold about it is that what makes it evil is its goal, that what it's after, it's not after anything positive. It's a complete lie to say what they want is freedom for Palestinians, they don't grant freedom to anybody in Gaza. The idea that they're fighting for freedom, that they're freedom fighters, is, it, as I say, it's a lie and an evasion of what they actually stand for, of what they say they stand for, of what they do in action. And the, the kind of stooges on campus for them and the apologists on U.S. campuses, that it's, oh, no, you have to see that they're battling for Palestinian freedom. They are not battling for Palestinian freedom. And part of the evidence for that, so at one level, what is evil about their goal is the destruction of Israel. But even if they achieve that, 
they remain evil and their goal is evil because the goal is a religious theocracy. They're like the Taliban or like the leaders in Iran. And regardless of whether there's Israel in the Middle East or not, what they do and what they want as a religious dictatorship is, is un, um, uh, abashedly evil. There's nothing good about that as a goal. And if that's what you're fighting for, what you're fighting for is a hundred percent evil. And that, and then the, the people are surprised by their brutality, their callous indifference to people, laughing as they kill people and so on. Yeah, but that comes from the goal. The goal is a complete disregard for human life, human freedom, human prosperity. There's a couple more points I wanted to bring. Should we take a couple of questions that have uh, come up here? One is about yeah. the idea of proportionality, which I think we'll we'll have a separate conversation about the laws of war, which come which proportionality is one of the guidelines that falls under that. Anything? Uh, so let me put the question. Just maybe we can answer it briefly here, with the promise of further discussion. So is there some kind of way in which proportionality makes sense in a conflict like this? And proportionality for people who are unfamiliar with it, it's the idea that you you don't want excessive force and it needs to be proportional to the attack. And, and one asterisk here is it's not clear how you understand what proportional is. So it's a sort of a legal international law of war concept. But let me just throw it back to you. How do you uh, approach that issue? Yeah, I, I think it's completely wrong. And but as you say, we could have a whole episode on talking about this. So just one aspect of it, of, and it touches on something we've already talked about. That is part of treating war like a game. It's, oh, um, uh, uh, here, take a, and, and like a sport. It's, oh, okay, you're playing uh, hockey and you're using wooden sticks. So the other side has to use wooden sticks as well. Otherwise, look, it's not fair. And yes, in the context of a game, you can say, yeah, one side can't have way superior equipment and then say, oh, well, it won and it must be the better team. No, if, you, if it has way better padding, way better equipment, then it's not a fair fight. War is not a game. Um, and so the idea that you want a fair fight between your soldiers and the people trying to kill them you want your soldiers as armed as possible, such that as few of them die as possible. And this is part of what it means that it, it is brutal. It's, one should never want to be in a position of having to kill another human being. And in, your life would be better if that other human being didn't exist. Like if somebody breaks into my house, I don't actually own a gun, but if I owned a gun and I shot the person, it's certainly legitimate to do that. I'm not hoping somebody breaks into my house so I can shoot them. And it well, I likely would find it traumatizing to have killed another person. That's part of the brutality of it. And anything that makes it seem like, oh no, it's just like a game. It's just, we're settling our differences by a different mechanism. Here we're trying to kill each other and other places will negotiate. And so that it it's not anything like that. And anything that makes it seem like that is on its face wrong and destructive. And the issue of proportionality is one of those issues. I want to respond to one of the questions in here and then bring up a, a different point and we should probably draw a line after that. So someone's asking in uh, the YouTube chat, does anyone have the right to defend themselves from Israel? I'm not sure where the question is coming from, but let me say that if the principle is that if you're an innocent victim and you're acting in self-defense and you're a free country, that's the context in which we're analyzing the situation because that's our evaluation of this particular conflict. We think, I think of Israel as the uh, victim of uh, Hamas and broadly Palestinian aggression, and it is acting in self-defense. And that's the context for the questions we've been uh, analyzing. If the tables were turned, if Israel were... Uh, an aggressor towards another country or another group of people, then those people would be in a position to say, well, we're acting in self-defense. So it, there's nothing inherent in it being Israel that we're somehow absolving it of responsibility. So Israel does do things wrong and it has done wrong things. So it's not, it's nothing um, 
there there certainly could be situations where someone has the right to defend themselves against Israel. Israel is the aggressor, but that's certainly not my view of what's happening in this conflict. So that's to address that point. Um, I want to take a slightly broader perspective and, and bring up this issue, which is, I think one of, I said at the beginning that one of the reasons this topic is difficult is that some of what we're seeing coming out of the conflict are harrowing pictures, harrowing stories, awful atrocities. And th this, it's difficult to process that. It's just, you see human beings put in awful positions if they're brutalized. And what happens, I think, is one of the things I've noticed, and I'm interested in your perspective on this is, understandably, people react quickly. They react to the images they see, they react to the video. And there's a way in which, I mean, when you think about the Palestinian side, it's, we, we hear these extraordinary situations. A million people, half the population is, is told you have to move south to get out of harm's way and the hardship that, that imposes, the, the blockade on food and electricity. And there's a kind of flooding of an emotional response of, of pity and the calls for mercy and the calls for uh, just the pointing and emoting about suffering, human suffering. And what I've noticed about, and, and I understand it, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that I, I certainly don't relish anyone being in that position, but the observation that I wanted to bring up is that it, emotions are not primary. They're, they're a result of a certain set of beliefs you have. And if your moral beliefs are at all influenced by altruism, the idea that morality is about sacrifice, what that does for you is I think it, it pushes you out of the right mind frame for thinking about this kind of issue, thinking rationally about it. Because I think what altruism tells you to do is to focus on suffering and to dwell on that to the exclusion and deliberately to the exclusion of all the relevant considerations that we've been talking about, which is, who is this person? What role did they have in this conflict? Are they complicit in it? Are they culpable? And what, to what degree? Are they innocent? Are they co collaborators? Are they morally responsible? Are they causally responsible? Are they both? Those are some of the things you have to think about, as we've been suggesting in this conversation. And those are important considerations that you can't drop out of the picture and simply point at the fact that there are people dying and people who are upset and people who are suffering. And that's your answer to the problem. And that's, that's your starting point. There's certainly an important part of the context, but it, it can't tell you what to do or how to evaluate this. And I think this is an, so another aspect of this is that to the extent people are influenced by this altruist assumption or premise, they might not even be aware of it warps their thinking about it and it also shuts them down for actual the, the actual thinking that needs to be done the the, the deliberation about moral responsibility in, in conflicts like this and how to conduct them uh, i'm just thinking about this and one of the insights ayn rand makes about altruism is that in many ways it severs cause from effect so you see this domestically in terms of the idea of quote, redistribution of wealth. You earned it, but you don't deserve to keep it. It has to go to those who haven't earned it and haven't uh, achieved it. And in that sense, there's, there's a severing between who carries out the action, who doesn't. But it works the other way around in terms of, well, you might be complicit with Hamas, but why, why should we hold you responsible for it if you're suffering? And I think that's, that's part of what I'm seeing in this conflict is that the role of that ethic, the altruist ethic, it both colors how people react to this and, and refuse to think about the important philosophic issues here. And it, it, it provides cover for not holding people responsible, not understanding their, their um, position with respect to the aggression. I'm curious if you've seen that and any reactions to that. Yes, I've seen that, and it is, this is part of the design of altruism, that it, it is devised 
so that one doesn't ask these questions. The moment you see suffering, the moment you see need, what it says is, okay, well, you've got to satisfy this. You've got to alleviate this, regardless of well, why does this suffering exist? What has this person done? Why are they in need? All those kinds of questions, which is all part of the causalities you're saying, all these, these are all causal questions that you're not supposed to ask. If you are um, strong, powerful, wealthy, have ability, your obligation is to serve the person who's suffering in need. So, And it doesn't matter how you've obtained your power, ability, money, um, whether virtuously or viciously, it doesn't matter why they're suffering or in need, whether it's it's through no fault of their own or through fault of their own. The 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 it, there's just one um kind of perspective which is the person who has power ability advantage which in this case is israel has to serve um and and sacrifice to the person who is in need who is suffering and so yes what you see then is well look and there is suffering in gaza and the primary source of that suffering is hamas so it's not as though there isn't, but if you, all those kinds of questions are like, why is there suffering here? Why is there no freedom in Gaza? If you don't ask and aren't supposed to ask any of those questions, all you, it, it's just a recipe and it's really, it's designed to aid evil and to penalize the good. Let me say one other thing that is sort of, in some ways, the flip side of this. I do not view either Israel, the US, or the Western world more generally here as blameless and that it, as morally blameless for what is going on, but not for the reasons that are typically advanced of criticism. It, it, it's a colonial race, Israel's a colonial racist power. So all of that is not true. Um, and similar accusations against the US that all it wants to do is subjugate the rest of the world. It is not true. The history of the US, I think, amply demonstrates that that is not true. Like we could have just um, taken over Japan. That's not what the US did. So it, it's a complete fabrication. The normal criticisms of the US, of Israel, and more broadly of the Western world. But what is true? is there is a moral responsibility and a moral obligation to be opposed to dictatorships, dictatorial regimes, including those seeking to become theocracies like Hamas. And there's an obligation to oppose them prior to them launching attacks, gaining power. And certainly you can't do things that treat them like Oh yeah, like this is just a political party. Maybe we should help them get elected, which the U.S. did um, as part of its um, so-called uh, foreign strategy of freedom in the Middle East. That I mean, that's monstrously unjust to do that. But part of why it's monstrously monstrously unjust is it's against our self-interest. It's against Israel's self-interest. It's against the self-interest of anybody who's actually freedom-loving. So there's a lot of criticism, and we've made at ARI um, in our writings, a lot of criticism of the foreign policy of the U.S., of Israel, of the Western world more broadly. Um, but not it's not for the reasons that are typically brought up. It's for appeasing evil and not recognizing it as evil and facing the fact that what you're dealing with are evil regimes. It's the Western world did the same thing in regard to Russia. And then that Russia feels emboldened to invade Ukraine. There's a lot of criticism of our foreign policy, but not like we're no different than Russia. That's not true. It's rather we, we who are essentially good have appeased evil. And unfortunately you have to bear consequences if you do that, as Israel is, as we did on 9-11 um, and as Ukraine is doing. Why don't we draw a line here? Let, thank you to all those who are watching and submitted your questions. We, we always gather them. We'll use them for ideas for other episodes, and we might do a Q&A on this topic. 
Thank you as well for those who submitted Super Chat support. We appreciate your commitment to what we do and enabling us to continue bringing these ideas forward. Uh, we'll be back with more episodes of New Ideal. We're, we're going to add a supplemental stream of podcast episodes just on the Israel-Palestinian uh, conflict and background on that. So look for additional episodes from us in a, uh, over and above the weekly episodes that we're doing. And as always, you can send us your comments and feedback by email, newideal at aynrand.org. We read everything. We welcome your comments. We try to answer as many as we can, and sometimes we make them into episodes. So we look forward to hearing from you. And uh, if you're watching us on the web in real time or afterwards, please leave a comment, like the video, subscribe. We really want to see your feedback, and this helps us reach more people. We also should mention resources uh, that you can take a look at. So uh, let's put those up on the screen. We have released uh, some clips of Ayn Rand's extemporaneous responses to questions about issues like this, about innocence in war and how to conduct military, uh, um, how to re retaliate in, in war. And, and those are now online. You can find them at that short link that's on the web, Ayn Rand on the death uh, of innocence in war. I think it's really uh, important to listen to those and, and hear how she goes about responding to those and just to recognize that these are from different contexts. So it wasn't that she was commenting on the issue of war or even this war, at all, obviously, uh, but just to understand how she comes at this issue, I think is really valuable. So those clips are now online. And I think we have one or two more resources that people can take a look at. Yeah, we have a page on our journal, New Ideal, where we're collecting uh, some of our commentary and that we're generating since the war began and some uh, things that are, offer good background, you can find those uh, at the short link on the screen and we'll put those in the show notes as well. And I think that's all for today. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Ankar. We'll see you all next time.